Hello, I am the Grub Street Lodger and we've reached the end of August. What dark and dingy August it's been. I'm looking out the window and it is grey as, as it has been for a lot this month. But enough of that, let's talk about what I read. Now the first book I read was Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. And I only just finished it in August. I finished it on the 1st of August. I was really hoping to finish it in July because my sister was also reading it in July. And I wanted uh, sort of almost a comparison in my head between both of what we made of it. But actually what we made of it was pretty similar. We both thought, it's all right. It's all right. Don't mind a bit of Pride and Prejudice. I tried to read it before. Um, I read it on a bus on the way to a techno nightclub. Uh, which may not have been the best time to do it. The reason being my copy is pocket-sized. And then I got frisked at the nightclub. They're like, what's this? I'm like, Pride and Prejudice. Uh, and I never quite got into it. My first impressions were that it was a bit um, complicated, actually. There were all these sisters, uh, all these Miss Bennets going about, and who was I supposed to really root for? And, and actually... It is more of an ensemble book than I was expecting. Now I knew a bit more. I thought, oh, okay, it's the Elizabeth Bennet story. But it isn't so much. It's mostly her story, but everyone else gets quite a good look in, to be honest. And um, so you have these sisters and their mum, who is desperate for them to get married, and their dad, who is sarcastic, who I really quite liked at first and then went off because he's only sarcastic. He doesn't really have any other qualities to him so uh, yeah uh, and then the sisters you've got the nice one uh, Jane you got Elizabeth who's sort of the smart one you've got the the bookish one who doesn't really get a look in and then you've got the two younger ones especially Lydia who are flighty and my main thing about this book was well there wasn't really a lot of good men on offer <laughs> you know the, the range of men in this book is not is not great uh, you you had the cousin, the, the reverend cousin, who is uh, just painful. And when her friend marries her, her friend knows that he's painful, but that she'll be able to cope with it. And she's got a pretty settled life. And it's worth putting up with this arsehole for the settled life. Well, he's not even an arsehole, is he? He's just, he's just an idiot, to be honest. Then you've got Mr. Wickham, who seems very um, charming, but is, is actually just a selfish git. Um, and then you've got Mr. Uh, Bingley, or oh, is it, I read this at the beginning of the month, the names are getting a bit wibbly, Mr. Bingley, who, uh, who's rich, good, uh, he's nice, he's very pleasant, but he's so easily swayed, he has no driver of his own, he has no real opinion of his own, if he fell in love with you, you'd be like, well, oh, yeah, you've, he's fallen in love with me, but... He's not exactly a passionate man, is he? And then you got Mr. Darcy, who was a passionate man and very rich, and who you're supposed to think he was uh, arrogant and unpleasant, and then you warmed him. And that was the main story, was these two people. Um, he thinks that she's, you know, in this family of rather silly people and, and below him, and she thinks that he's this arrogant sod, and then they, 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 they bend towards each other. He bends first. Um... And yeah, it was pleasant. It was nice. The fact is, though, I I can't, I can't see Darcy as this big romantic hero uh, because he's not very nice. And even when he's nice, he's pretty stiff and awkward. His 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 big declaration for love, um, you know, I utterly adore you. It it still comes off as kind of rote. <laughs> it's just, I utterly adore you. And I'm sure that the film versions, of which I surprisingly have never seen a version, uh, are much warmer. <laughs> I'm sure when you got your Matthew McFadden's or your... Um, or her, the one in the BBC who gets wet, Colin Firth's and that, I'm sure that's a bit more... You know, when you got your, your handsome, hot actor doing it, it works a bit better. But I still didn't think he was a great catch, to be honest. It wasn't like he was dark and Byronic, like, a, you know... Like, uh, I was going to say Mr. Rochester, uh, who, many red flags there. But, yeah, he wasn't that interesting. <laughs> I much preferred, I think it was called Mr. Collins? I can't quite remember. I'm very bad with names of characters. I'm very sorry about that. But the, the love interest in Northanger Abbey, the earlier work, because he was kind of fun and he was a little bit sarcastic and he was a little bit socially awkward. Um, 
but he had a lot of life to him. And I, I didn't think Darcy did. But that aside, I can see why it's become this huge cultural touchstone. Because um, it is it is kind of grounded, but it is very funny. You've got Jane Austen doing her Jane Austen. You know, very sharp uh, claws hidden by velvet gloves. It's very, you know, on the scalpel. It's very tight. I suppose I prefer something a little bit more rambunctious than what I got, but I did enjoy it and uh, I'm glad I read it and I'm going to read some more Jane Austen as the year progresses. Now we have a jump cut because actually I'm finding it difficult to remember the books I read because one, I don't have the physical copies here uh, because I have secreted them at my parents. But also um, because the last book so overshadowed the others just in pure length. You'll see where I'm going. But so the next book that I read was, haha. My Sister the Serial Killer by Oyin Khan Braithwaite. And I picked this up for a quid from a charity shop because I'd kind of been intrigued by the cover and then I read the first couple of pages. And it's about two sisters. One is very uptight and she cleans things and she's a nurse and she's very, um, everything in its place, very, very ordered. The younger one is very loose, very loose, very relaxed and she just happens to kill people. Uh, she is the serial killer. In fact, so far, she's killed her boyfriends always in self-defense. But some of this self-defense gets a bit... Mm, yes, you're not sure about it. And as it goes on, you find out that they've had, you know, they've had this dark past with this terrible ogre of a father who, and it's never fully, fully explained, either gets ill, drops dead, and they don't do anything about it, or drops dead as a result of some of their actions. He's certainly this ogre who dies in front of them, and they don't even mention him. It is very slowly sort of leaked into the plot, and it makes clear sense of why these two sisters have these two different ways. One, who is always trying not to be noticed, and the other, who has this sort of devil-may-care, you know, I can kill people and get away with it attitude. The conflict of the book comes about when... The, the murderous sister fall, fancies, falls in love with a doctor who the, the, the uptight sister also fancies. And so now she's thinking, oh dear, people who date my sister really don't have a very long shelf life. What am I going to do? And it's a very short novel. I looked it up. It's only something like 45,000 words. Um, but it crams a lot in it, and it was very engaging and very interesting and kind of thrilling. And some of it, I guessed, was going to happen. There were some twists, um, a spoiler. But there was a, somebody who was in a coma, and she was telling all her problems to. Well, the only thing that's got to happen, then, is that person's got to wake up and, and know the secret. But it surprised me, because they knew the secret but didn't say the secret. They didn't then use it against them in any way. And that, it ended up where she chooses her sister over her lovers and so um he doesn't actually get killed he gets arrested but you know, you know this younger sister's going to keep on going and this older sister's going to keep on covering for her and they're locked into that uh it was a very good book i very much enjoyed it after that i read peter Lou by jacqueline Ryden. and i actually got this for free uh because i did a sort of guess the Hogarth picture because her newest book out is a biography of Hogarth which I look forward to buying and reading and this was all about the Peterloo massacre which took place on the 16th 16th of August and so I wanted to read it and write a few things on my blog before that point and this was not quite 18th century but it was um 18 19 I want to say but I actually might be wrong because names and dates I remember stories <laughs> but it told a good story and it was all about um, you've got the rise in popular working class sort of consciousness and you've got uh, groups of people coming together and talking about how the, the political system needs to be rejigged at the time because this is when you still got rotten boroughs which are things like they have no people in them but two MPs and then you have places like Manchester which had loads of people and, and no MPs and so they thought right we need to draw up new boundaries to reflect where people are actually living now and we need to make um, every male, uh, I think it's every male with, with uh, lower property to vote 
and and so not huge, you know, not universal vo- emancipation, um, not emancipation, what's the word, universal suffrage or anything, but some significant improvements. And clubs were brought out to talk about this. And the way they started to press the government was to have these things called monster meetings, which were essentially big rallies. And there were plans of these big rallies around. And the government are getting worried. <laughs> the, the, the king's speech was well, actually the prince regent who gave it, but the king's speech essentially said, I know there's a lot of shit stuff at the moment. It's not our problem. We, we didn't do it. Just, just don't blame us. <laughs> Which, oddly enough, didn't temper the climate. And so you've got, on one hand, this increasingly mobile, um, disenfranchised group of people. And on the other hand, this increasingly paranoid government who were shortly going to face the Cato conspiracy. So they had some reason to be paranoid, but they were very paranoid. And this comes to a clash uh, in a St. Peter's field where the, the the people containing the riot didn't contain it. They waded in and sliced people and, and knocked them about with their horses. And there was a film recently by Mike Lee about it. And this is the book by Jacqueline Wyden, who is the historian on that film. And yes, she told this story very well. You got this real sense of these two forces that are going to come into collision at some point. And you also just got some funny little bits. Like there was this guy who was a, a quack doctor who was one of the sort of speakers on the circuit. And he was illiterate and he was very proud. And when he made his manner, it looked threatening, even though it said the word love, but it was black with scary white writing going love, <laughs> like a skull or something. I, there was a lot of little fun details, which is what you want in one of these kind of books. Because I'm not the big political theorist; it's not, it's not my area. And so I got enough of that to understand what's going on, and enough little fun bits for me to continue. One of the things I found most interesting was the the first formation of these um, groups of of women protesters. Uh, the first one being in Blackburn, which is the first. Uh, registered, organised political female group in British history. And then there was the Manchester one as well. And that was kind of interesting because for a start, they weren't hankering for universal suffrage at this time. They're, they're just saying one vote, one household. And then, you know, but they start giving birth to this whole movement of, of, of women, you know, political engagement and things. And I found that very interesting. Uh, and I found... Uh, yeah, just this, it really builds on the, the tension before the, the, the clash. And it was very good and very enjoyable. And it told me quite a lot. And I remembered quite a lot. <laughs> I could tell you a lot more about Peterloo if, if I wanted to. But let's move on to the next one. Now, actually, I was going to go on to the big book of the month after that. But I realised when I was looking up agents, that quite a few of them were saying that Beth O'Leary's flat share was one of their favourite books um, of the moment, you know, recent-ish books. And there was a copy of it in my parents' house on my sister's bookcase. I thought, well, OK, let's try it out. And so I started this book and I thought, this is a bit rubbish. I don't really get what they're going on about. This is full of cliché. You, know, you had the, the main character. She, it was like she could be played by Miranda, the you know, TV. She was large and awkward and clumsy and she wore bright clothes and she sort of bumbled around and she had a big, bright, bubbly personality. Uh, and and it just seemed cliche after cliche. And then the other character was this guy called Leo, who's a quiet um, nurse. And they share a flat, but they share a flat in a weird way. She has it in the day at the weekends, and he has it in the evenings. And at the weekends, he goes to his girlfriends. But of course, they start you know, communicating through notes and they start falling in love. And it reminded me of, if you know, Cox and Box, which is a Gilbert, um, is it a Gilbert or no Sullivan? It's, it's an operetta by one of those people. It's pretty good. I've seen it about three times because a friend was in it, uh, where two men share flat, one in day, one in night. But they don't actually know the other one's there. But these two know, and they, yeah. But I was, I was wondering, to be honest, because it, it felt weirdly dated. It came out in 2019, but so much has happened since 2019 that the things we were worried about in 2019 and talking about seem a bit out of date. <laughs> yeah, you know, it didn't, you know. And then other bits leaked in. So we got more depth in the in the male character. We found out his brother has been unfairly imprisoned. 
and uh, it was quite a horrible story, really, about this guy who went out and got drunk and um, chatted up someone, didn't really work, and was wandering home drunk, and the people he was chatting up framed him for an armed robbery, and he was in prison, and it was really quite interesting. And I thought, okay, that's kind of interesting. And then there was a slightly quirky bit about uh, going to find the... Uh, World War Two gay lover of someone in a nursing home, and that was a bit too quirky, but it got him out of the flat essentially. But then there was the story of the main character's ex boyfriend, who at first was just, uh, it's not a very good ex boyfriend. But then as it, it went on, it became, he wasn't just not very good, he was properly abusive, he was emotionally abusive, he was a Wemis, uh, if you remember old Wemis, which I now found out is the old. Um, not the elbow pit, is it? It's, it's the elbow skin is a wemis, the loose skin there. But anyway, yeah, he was an unpleasant, you know, nasty person. And all the cliche of the beginning was because that's how he made her feel. You know, she remembered things, but he told her she didn't remember things. She was beautiful, but he told her she was ugly. So when I was thinking, well, why is this supposedly large, ugly person attracting basically every man around her? What a, yeah, I don't like that. That's really irritating. It turns out it was because she was beautiful, but she'd been made to feel hideous because of this nasty guy. And so all of the cliches that I was thinking, this is not getting me. Ooh. The result of this horrible snide getting in, and so by the end of it, you're thinking, "Oh, this is really good. This is this has taken what could be, um, you know, just just something very bland, and everything that was pointing to it to being bland is actually a hint at the dark undercurrent underneath." Also, it was quite funny, and the characters by that that end time were really engaging. And it was probably my favourite book of the month. So I'm glad I picked that up. But the whole month I knew I was building to something. And what I was building to was this book here. It's called Duck's New Report. As you can see, it is very, very long. It's in fact, the story part of it is a thousand pages. And for most of the thousand pages, there isn't a full stop. Or paragraphing. Or, I mean, to say it's all one sentence is not true. But it's just a solid block of text. And the text is uh, sort of occasionally you get a subplot. And the subplot is in paragraphs, but that's never more than the page. So you, every 50 or 60 pages of just solid wall of text with no uh, full stops or anything, you've got a small paragraph bit. So what is it about? The, the solid wall of text is uh, a suburban mother in America, and she's thinking things. She's remembering bits of her life. She's worrying about things. She's thinking about films she's watching. She's thinking about food. She's making a pie most of the time. For the good half, first half of the book, she's making a pie. Um, she's thinking about that. She's thinking about food. She's thinking about po politics. She's thinking an awful lot about environment, and environmentalism and pollution, which she really worries about. She's thinking about her relationships with her children. She's particularly uh, worried about her relationship with her eldest daughter at the moment, who's being uh, very standoffish and seems to hate her, she thinks. And, uh, yeah, so she's just doing that. She's thinking about books. She's very keen on the um, the Little House on the Prairie series. <laughs> and that's most of the book. And then occasionally we get this um, more normally narrated part about uh, a lioness and her cubs, and she loses her cubs, and she goes and tries to find them. And these things come together. They don't always come together as you think they would. And there is a plot, and there are actions, and there are occurrences, and they occur almost solely in the back half of the book. Um, but yeah, what is it doing? What is it for? There's a helpful hint here. Now, at the back of the book, <laughs> one, there's this whole dictionary of, um, of uh, acronyms. Which is very handy because Americans use too many acronyms for me. I don't understand what they mean half the time. And then there's an appendix of quotes. And the first quote is, For he rolls upon prank to work it in. For having considered God in himself, he will consider his neighbour. For he is the tribe of Tyre. It is Our Cat Jeffrey by our friend Christopher Smart, who wrote Jubilate Agno. 
And there is an element of jubilate agno in his book, because jubilate agno is trying to sum up all of creation to praise God. And each part starts with, for this, um, oh, what's the other bit? Let's, let's and for. So let, you know, uh, Abraham prays with the goat for he is a creature of much sacrifice. I make that up. But, you know, it's that kind of, so you, you get four, 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 let, 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 but you're supposed to get four, let, four, let. In this, the repeated phrase is the fact that. So instead of full stops, she'll just say the fact that. Or if she's changing topic, the fact that, the fact that, the fact that. And it has a similarly, um, well, one, it has a similar environmental kind of idea about animals and, and, and people and their relationship. But it has a similar kind of encyclopedic thing. Because Jubilate Agno, when he started off writing it, was supposed to be a praise to God. But then as he went on, it became sort of self-therapy. It became him exploring scientific ideas. At times, it became just a way of keeping time. Just, you know, he writes this for three three lines a day. So this is how he keeps time uh, or remembers friends. Or, you know, it has all these different things. It's trying to encompass so much. And this book is trying to do that. And I think the big point is that, well, one, mothers are good even if they don't always feel it, because mothers and daughters and mothers and children is a big, big thing. She deeply misses her mother. She's deeply worried about her children. And then the subplot, lioness and her cubs. But also, it's about how full our lives and our thoughts are with all these stuff. So that the lion is just instinct. Recoil and pounce, as it keeps saying. But the mum, there's just so much stuff, you know, just, all this stuff all the time in her head it's, it overcomplicates the relationships and I think that's a big part of it um, it was hard to read it was very hard to read it took me a long time there were you know, I think the longest I went without reading it at all was three days I ended up finishing it in I think I read about 400 pages in three days at the end and actually it worked better when you read big big chunks because um, the accumulation of it and it's not just that it has thoughts, it's that it then just sometimes has words that come up. So it'd be, oh, the fact that my daughter doesn't like me anymore, the fact that maybe all teens dislike their mum, the fact that I loved my mum when I was a teen, the fact that I feel like I lost my mum when I was a teen, stick, tick, stick, the fact that, you know, just odd words that come up and, and, and some of these refer to things and some of these, the stick, tick, stick was, uh, she once saw one of those and wondered what it was. Um, there's a bit where she says she doesn't remember the word hydrangea, so the word hydrangea just keeps popping up, and then it goes on these sort of free associative rants, so sometimes it'll go like hydrangea, load ranger, to tonto, toto, wizard of oz, oz, courage, courage, and then it'll be in little music bits, yo, I have no courage, the fact that I have no courage, the fact that uh, when the lady had a go at me I said nothing, yeah, it's strange, and you never really quite get in the flow. I, well, I never write quite got in the flow. But, and it did build to a climax, but in some ways that was disappointing. I wanted it either to be more of a climax and have a really downer ending. The ending I predicted for it was a lot worse than the ending that came, a lot more miserable than the ending that came. Or for it not to, for it just to be unapologetic all the way through without any kind of plot or action. And it kind of mushes that a bit towards the end. I'm glad I read it. I don't think I'd ever sit and read it all again. I might look at bits of it again. Uh, and it might be one that I come back to and think about a fair few times. Uh, if you, Because I read it because I wanted something big, chunky and difficult to attack over the summer holiday. If you want something big, chunky and difficult, this isn't as difficult as all that. You understand everything she's saying. But there's so much of it. So, yeah. I start work um, two days' time. Uh, we'll see what next month is. Good night.